Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We just finished our study through Philemon. We're going to begin a study through Galatians next Sunday. So this Wednesday, we're going to talk about angels and judgment. Our Father and our God, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit take and seal to our hearts that which is truth, filtering out all of, of the error, everything that's carnal and fleshly. For we give you all the glory. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. For the past seven years, we've been looking at the subject of biblical eschatology uh, from different angles, the study of last things. So if you'll turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, I'd like to read verses 12 through 17. Giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. All things consist. Now in light, or in addition to this passage of Scripture, there's a passage I'm sure that you're all familiar with. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon, or darkness covered the face of the deep. Colossians says that all things in heaven and earth, principalities, powers, they were all created by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis 1, uh, 1, we are told that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Tonight's video is about the judgment of angels, not creation. That's a, that would be a different study, but if we properly translate the Hebrew, it would say that at some time God created out of nothing the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. But if you look at it in the Septuagint, if you look at it in the Vulgate, and if you look at it in, in any ancient translation, it's translated A in the English translation. And so modern science comes to the conclusion that God created the heavens and the earth and it, it was a mess. It was the Big Bang. And, in six, and then in six geological ages or six days, He made order out of chaos. Uh, I don't believe the text says that. Did God create everything in chaos and a waste and then spend six days making order out of chaos? Well, experts in Hebrew all say that something happened between verse 1 and verse 2 so that the earth became waste and void. And many people say no, uh, because if you support that from the Hebrew text, you violate the Big Bang. I believe very strongly that God created from nothing the heavens and the earth. And when He did that, it looked old. Some have suggested that God would be deceptive if He created everything with the appearance of age. I don't, I don't see where that that's the case. I suggest that it is impossible to create anything that doesn't look old. I don't think it can be done. 
I've always amused myself uh, by asking folks if they thought Adam had a belly button because everybody knows that Adam and Eve weren't born, so they, they wouldn't have had navels. Well, nobody knows that. Uh, my personal opinion is if God created man out of the dust of the earth, he had a navel, just like when he created trees, if you had cut one down, it would have been rings in the tree. I'm not saying he had a mother and a father. I think God made him, but I think God made him a man. And when God created the radioactive decay chain, God created several billion years of age, but he created it out of nothing and now our text in Colossians says that included principalities and powers. And principalities and powers are Greek idioms that are used of angels. So we created angels. He hadn't created man yet. And tonight we come to the study of the judgment of angels and that's the judgment that we know the least about. We know quite a bit about angels if we take the time to study the Word of God. And the only thing that we know about angels really that's valid is, is what we have from this book, what we have in the Word of God. First of all, we know that there are a, a heck of a lot of, the, of these angels. In 2 Kings, he answered and said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. That, that's a marvelous verse. I don't know whether you know where it, it, it came from or not, but, but there's Elisha and the king of Syria is trying to defeat Israel. And every time the king of Syria plans the next, gets his generals together and plans the next campaign, Elisha tells the king of Israel what it is and, he's, and he is there to stop it. And the king of Syria can only reach one conclusion Man, we got a spy in the house. You know, somebody is here in our military campaign and they're feeding this information to Israel. And one of these guys has a, a little bit of sense and he says to the king of Syria, that's not the case. You know, we're not uh, double agents. It's that prophet Elijah, he's feeding the king of Israel all our plans because he knows them. Even though he's not here with us. And the king of, of Assyria basically says, we'll take care of that. We'll just kill the guy. And he sends a vast army to kill him. He must have really been impressed with Elisha. And, you know, many of you probably know the story. Elisha's servant wakes up in the morning. Uh, they are absolutely surrounded with chariots and weapons and military might. And he runs in and he says, you know, Master, we're done. We're done for. And Elisha calmly says, uh, you know, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. And I believe the text is clear that every one of those horses was ridden by an angel. And every one of those chariots was driven by an angel. And it was full of them. In Mark, the Lord asked an individual what his name was. And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. The word many... Uh, uh, the word many means there's you know huge amounts. In Matthew 26, the Lord said, Don't you think I could pray to the Father and He'd give me more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions. The word legion, you know, is a military term that was taken from the Roman army. A legion denoted a group of at least 6,000 Roman soldiers. Although the total number could be higher. This means that any time we read about a legion of anything, we can, we can know that it always refers to at least 6,000 of something. An amazing example of this is found in Mark chapter 5, verse 9, where the Bible tells us, 
that a demon-possessed man had a legion of demons. That means that this man had an infestation of at least 6,000 demons residing inside him. So, how many angels would, would there be in 12 legions? Well, since the word legion refers to at least 6,000, it means a legion of angels would be you know, at least 6,000. However, Jesus said the Father would give him more than 12 legions of angels if he requested it. Because it'd be pure speculation to try to figure out how many more than 12 legions would be. Let's just stick with the figure of 12 legions uh, to see how many angels that, that entails. One legion is 6,000 angels, so if you just simply multiply that number by 12, well, we get, uh, you know, that we see that, that 12 legions of angels would include a minimum of 72,000 angels. But Jesus said the Father would give him more than 12 legions of angels. Therefore, you can conclude that there were potentially many, many, additional thousands of angels available to Jesus the night that He was arrested. In Hebrews chapter 12, you haven't come to a mountain that burns with fire, but you, you've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Innumerable. I don't know how many guardian angels that you and I have, but I'm persuaded there are angels which are in heaven who always behold the face of the Lord. I, personally, I believe that God has supplied each, each one of us with more than one guardian angel. My wife told me the other day not to drive faster than my guardian angel could fly, and I told her not to worry because I'm positive that they could fly faster than I could drive. But there's an innumerable company of angels. You can't count them. We are surrounded by a spiritual world into which we have very few glimpses with that innumerable company of angels. I think if God opened our eyes to it, it'd scare us to death. There, there are some good ones. In 1 Timothy 5, I charge thee before God in the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before the other. In Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, He shall sit upon the throne of His glory. I don't know how many of those there are, but Hebrews tells us it's innumerable and they're the elect angels the holy angels, the elect angels of God. Now I began by pointing out to you that God had created out of nothing the heavens and the earth. And in Colossians, at the time He did that, He created the principalities, the powers, and, and, and so forth. I believe God created some angels as His elect and some angels who had a freedom to choose. Now, I don't have time to develop that, that theory, but if, if all of the angels had the freedom to choose, if they all had the freedom to choose, they all would have chosen to turn against God. Or there's something wrong with our biblical philosophy. I believe God is pointing out that there can only be one will and it must be His. If there's any other will, it, it will cross God's will. And so I believe the elect angels, the holy angels, are angels that God elected and separated unto Himself and they don't have a choice to turn against Him. And I think there's something wonderful in that. Because you, as a new creation in Christ Jesus, do not have the choice to turn against God. Every one of you who has been born by the Spirit of God, by the will of God, 
Not by anything you did, not by your choice, nothing. It's because God decreed that you were His and you became His sheep and there is nothing, no power on earth and no power that you possess to ever have you be anything but one of His sheep. I don't know how more fervently and strongly to point out that we are absolutely secure in Christ. The preservation of the saints. God preserves His own. Now I believe that that was true in, with the holy angels. There wasn't a one of them that could have chosen not to be His angel any more than, than you or I could choose not to be His sheep. You are His sheep. And, and dearly beloved, even if you deny Him, He remains faithful and cannot deny Himself. He paid the price and you are His. So we have these good angels, but we also have these bad angels. In Isaiah 28, we have the account of Lucifer, son of the morning, who uttered his uh, six I wills you know, I will arise and be like the Most High. I will ascend into heaven. I will, I will sit on the throne of God. And God says that He was perfect in all of His ways until sin was found in Him. And He was the sum of wisdom and knowledge. Imagine the sum of wisdom and knowledge choosing to violate the will of God, but He did. Surely you, you would in your own will. But he made his uprising against God. And since the text says in Isaiah 28 that he would ascend and be like the Most High, the conclusion by most Bible students is that Lucifer's sphere of influence was the earth. We read that today that he's the God of this world. So this was Lucifer's area of authority and it's from here that he decided that he would ascend and be like the Most High. And I believe that's what we are seeing in between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. I have no idea how long that was. That might have been billions and billions and billions of years. I don't know. It could be that God said to Satan, okay, you ruined it. Now you fix it. And, you know, and he waited around for a few billion years until Satan was fully frustrated and then God rebuilds it in six days. And why he took six days, I, I, well, I think you know. I, you know, you could have done it in six microseconds, but he was, he was establishing this 6,000 year, 1,000 year pattern that we're familiar with today. So Satan made an uprising against God. Something happened and God said He'd judge it and He did. And I believe that judgment was Satan's uprising against God and it was a devastating judgment. It would be, it would be just stupid for me to suggest that there weren't animals or creatures or whatever in God's original creation there were principalities and powers and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and that may be much of the fossil record. Of course, a bunch of it must have come from the flood. But something terrible happened between those two verses. Personally, I believed it judged Satan. Now we have other verses of Scripture that indicate, for example, in Revelation, when Satan is cast out of heaven, he draws a third part of the stars of heaven, which uh, I believe are an idiom for angels. And we know that other angels followed him in his uprising against God, at least a third of them, uh, maybe more. And I believe those angels were given the power of choice, just as Lucifer was, so that God could demonstrate in the angelic realm that no will that was different than God's will, no matter how perfect it may be, if it's not God's will, eventually they will cross. Now, bear with me, I'm, I'm getting there. 
We have other passages of Scripture that indicate that there are evil angels. Matthew 25, Then he shall say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And so the demons or the, or the evil angels are called Satan's angels in Matthew 8. Satan's angels. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? And these were the demons that possessed the man in Matthew 8. Before the, that phrase before the time seems to infer in their mind that they face a day of judgment. Uh, Revelation 12, 4, you're all familiar with that. His tail draws a third of the stars of heaven, casts them down to the earth. I believe the idiom, the stars of heaven, are angels who follow Lucifer in his uprising against God. In Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, you, go, you know, who deceives the whole world, and he was cast into the earth, and all of his angels with him. Those are the evil angels. Now we have an interesting passage in Genesis, chapter 6, that the sons of God saw the daughters of women, and they committed fornication with them and it seems as though the text says a, a result of that were giants in the earth the Nephilim whether the uh, correct translation of the word is giants or not there were oddities in the earth as a result of that union I would not argue with you at all if you join the great majority of Christians who believe that the sons of God there were the descendants of Seth, you know, for you know, a few verses before this, it says that the descendants of Seth began to call on the name of the Lord and the daughters of women were the descendants of Cain. I don't know whether that's a majority view or not, but it's pretty close to, to a majority view. Although we, 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 do, we have verses of Scripture that indicate there were angels who left their proper estate. You know, I, I, could, I could read those. You know, for God spared not the angels that sinned, but did cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And those are verses we're going to look at uh, at some point for judgment. But, but what was the sin of these angels? It could have been following Satan. I have no argument with that. However, coupled with Jude and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own dwelling, their own habitation, their own natural environment, he's reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. I think that's somewhere beneath our feet. That's my personal view on that. I believe the sons of God in Genesis 6 were angels. They co cohabited with the daughters of men and a freak kind of a creature resulted from that union which finally died out in the earth. I think some fossils of that, of that oddity have been preserved as a result of the flood and have given some little sort of a impetus to the foolishness of the evolutionary idea of, you know, Darwin's theory of evolution. It's, it's not even a theory, it's a hypothesis. But be that as it may, there are some today who believe that the demons that are mentioned in the Scriptures are the souls of the results of that union between the sons of God and the daughters of women. And I have no idea whether that's true or not. I don't see that it needs to be true. I believe Satan's angels are sometimes called demons. And sometimes they're called uh, the devil and his angels. 
I don't think that you have to limit the word demon to the result of that union between the sons of God and the daughters of women. Although there's uh, some that do. And I, I don't know whether that's right or not. What I do know, what I do know, is that there's going to be a judgment. Don't you know, says the Lord, that we shall judge angels? If we're going to judge angels, how much more the things that pertain to this life? Now clearly the reference is that there, there will be a judgment for angels and we are going to be involved. It seems unscriptural to suggest that the holy angels, the, the separated angels, the elect angels of God face judgment. I don't think they do. You don't face judgment as a new creation in Christ Jesus. So I don't believe there's any judgment for the holy angels, for the elect angels of God. I don't believe that they were ever given the power to turn against God or to cross His will. But there clearly is a judgment for angels. And I believe that to be these angels of Satan, referred to as Satan's angels, those who followed him in his uprising against God, and God didn't spare them. He's reserved them in chains of darkness, reserved unto judgment. That's, now, that's all introduction. Now we can get to ask a question or two here. There's, there's a lot of questions I could, we could ask. But one would be, when is this judgment? When is that? Well, there was the judgment of our our. A sin on the cross through the vicarious suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ in our place. He was actually said to be crucified before the foundation of the world. There was the judgment of the flood. There's the, there's the judgment seat of Christ, the accounting of the believer's works. There's no condemnation there. There's the judgment of Israel. Israel faces the judgment as a nation. Uh, we, members of His body, we do not face judgment. There's therefore now no judgment to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And then there's the judgment of the nations. Judgment of the nations. We have clear indication from the text that we are surrounded by a spiritual world that is populated with innumerable angels. And, and we've been clearly told that we're going to judge angels. Our new creations do not turn against God. We are also, we're also told that those angels that followed Satan, God is reserved in chains of darkness against that day of judgment. I don't know where that darkness is. I, I gave you my thoughts on that. I think it's beneath our feet. But back in Genesis 1-2, and the earth became without form and void or waste, and desolation and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That word deep in the Septuagint, folks, is the same word that's translated bottomless pit in the book of Revelation. Same word. Same word that's translated the pit of the abyss that was open to allow the demons out uh, during the 70th week of Daniel to wreak all kinds of havoc on earth. That, that's the place and that's where they are and uh, they're reserved for the day of judgment. They're in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. The great day. And what is that? that? That great day, I believe, is that day when the great white throne judgment occurs. And so there are two judgments. I, I doubt that they're concurrent. I can't tell you which one's first and which one's second. It, it's, it's, it's normally concluded by most Bible students that the judgment of the angels precedes the great white throne judgment. So it looks like the judgment of the fallen angels immediately precedes the great white throne judgment. You know, for you uh, remember that in the book of Revelation, that before the great white throne judgment, Satan is taken and cast into the lake of fire. 
He's not there as its king. He's not the king of hell. He's, he's, he's the, the chief victim of hell. And that occurs before the great white throne judgment. So it seems natural to, to conclude that the judgment of these angels precedes the great white throne judgment and is probably concurrent with that judgment of Satan when he's taken at the end of the kingdom age, the end of the kingdom age, and he's cast into the lake of fire. So what is our part in that judgment? What, what is our function? We do have a passage of Scripture that says we're going to judge angels. And if we're going to do that, we ought to be able to judge in things concerning this life. And I, I don't want to disappoint you folks, but I don't know what our activity will be in that judgment, but I will offer a suggestion. It could be that the text says that we, because of what has been done for us, will be used as a testimony against those angels that will be used to bring about their judgment and their condemnation. We are all demonstrations of, examples of, not our own good wor works, our own good deeds, but God's grace. I think every knee shall bow, and that includes Satan and his angels. Vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction. Are all the angels judged? I do not believe the elect angels are judged because they haven't done anything for which they could be judged. They've never disobeyed the will of God. They've never sinned against God. They haven't been put in chains of darkness reserved for judgment. We have no, at least I don't see it, we have no scriptural indication that any of God's elect angels ever crossed Him. And if they never crossed Him, they don't deserve judgment. It seems as if, at least to me, and I've, I've been doing this a while, folks, it's, it's, it, verse by verse, studies through various books of the Bible, topical studies on this, that, or the other thing. And, it, and, it, and there, there seems to, to be a common denominator, a thread that runs throughout all of that that never changes. And that's grace, the grace of God. What will it be like when we judge angels? Folks, I can't tell you. But what I do believe is that our lives will be a testimony in the case of that judgment. You know, when, when we go to court, when people go to court and they, they put witnesses on the stand, we, are, we shall judge angels says the text. And we are witnesses of God's grace. We, our testimony, our witness, our message is one of grace. The grace of God and the love of God. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Join us Sunday as we begin our study through this interesting epistle of, to the Galatians, which deals with the very subject of law versus grace in the believer's walk. Until then, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.